At age 16, George Story left an adventure-filled childhood behind and went out into the city of New Haven, Connecticut in search of an apprenticeship and a future. He wandered the streets up and down and finally secured himself a position in Mr. Northrup's ship carver's shop. In the shop, they made the figureheads and the tailboards that adorned many of the ships that came and went from the harbor there at New Haven, Connecticut. At first, he could sweep the floor, but then he, they found he was good at the carving. And he went to New York on packet ships, and he took a sketch pad, and he drew the figureheads and the tailboards, and he was able to combine the different elements to make new patterns. Pop Northrup's shop was doing very well. On his free time, George Story liked to wander the streets of New Haven and see what kind of adventure he could find. And one day as he walked down a street, he looked into a window front. There were paintings inside. He was drawn to them. How do you paint lips that look so real you could kiss them? A landscape so alive that you felt you could step into it. He was so drawn to the images. He felt himself embarrassed for standing so long and moved along, only to return time and again, going by ever so slowly so that he could look at the pictures and finally mustered up the courage to go in and ask, how do you paint a painting like that? But the artist was prominent and very busy and didn't have time for a teenager's questions or an apprentice. He gave him the name of Charles Hine, another artist in the city at the time who might be interested in an apprentice. And with the name in hand, young George Story went off in search of Mr. Hine. And it wasn't long before he secured a second apprenticeship. Mornings, he would be in the carving shop with Pop Northrup and the boys doing the figureheads. And afternoons, he would go over to Mr. Hine's studio and they would paint every afternoon. And the canvases started to stack up on the floor. They were bad. They were awful. They got a little better. They weren't so bad. And finally, after two years of painting every day, there was a portrait George Story was proud of. And Charles Hines said he was ready to hang out his own shingle and begin painting. But in New Haven at that time, there were already four prominent artists painting portraits. There wasn't enough work, not enough commissions. And soon he and his wife made their way to Portland, Maine, where she had family, and he hoped to find more work there. He did paint in Portland for some time, but found the winter in his lungs didn't agree. And so, leaving his wife with her family, he boarded a train and headed south in search of a city with more commissions and a better climate. George Story stepped off the train in 1861, Washington, D.C. What possibilities could the nation's capital hold for this young man, now 26 years old, he spent his first day up and down the streets of the nation's capital thinking of the commissions for ambassadors and senators. It would be wonderful. There, there should be plenty of work in this city. As he wandered the streets, scoping them out, he went by a window of a shop, and inside were many daguerreotype portraits. The sign said it was the photo studio of Matthew Brady. He was an emerging photographer of the time. But down in the corner of that window was a little sign that said, Studio for Let. That was exactly what he needed, and he went right inside to inquire. That was the moment George Story met Alexander Gardner for the very first time, and he was shown upstairs into a studio space that was filled with natural light, perfect for painting portraits and landscapes. They began to discuss the business arrangements that would need to be made between them, Alexander Gardner offered that if George Story's painting was good enough, that he would send clients upstairs after they'd have a photograph taken, and George Story could send clients who came for a portrait down for a photograph, and in sharing clientele, they both might do better. But Gardner wouldn't do that until he had seen evidence of Story's painting ability. The very next morning, George Story was at the door to the shop and presented him a view of a beautiful portrait of a young lady he had just completed, and the deal was sealed. And soon his studio was set up upstairs and he began to paint, and their friendship began to grow.
One morning, as he painted upstairs, Gardner bounded up the stairway. Story, would you come down to the studio and pose the president for a photograph? President Lincoln? Of course. And the two made their way down the stairs and into Matthew Brady's photo studio. The president of the United States had already arrived. He had walked across the studio and seated himself in a small chair by a side table with an inkwell on it. He was lost in a trance of concentration, and Story tapped Gardner. Gardner, don't do a thing. Move your camera here, for there is your photograph. Moments later, it was done, and John Nicolay tapped the president, Sir, we're finished here. And the president got up still in his trance of concentration. Could it have been emancipation or a bill or the pending war that was on his mind that day? But he walked out of the studio, never losing a beat and never saying a word. Some days later, Gardner returned to George Story's studio as he worked one morning. I got a commission for you to paint a cabinet-sized portrait of the president from the photograph. George Story thought on it a moment. No, the president is far too important a man and far too difficult a character to capture without a live sitting. No, if I could not have a live sitting, then I think I should rather decline the commission. Gardner understood. I'll see what I can do, was the best he could offer. Some days later, Gardner returned. I've spoken with John Nicolay. President Lincoln's secretary, and he said he's very sorry, but President Lincoln is far too busy to take time out of his schedule for a portrait sitting. He's very sorry. But if you were so inclined, you could go to his office as he sees visitors and sketch him there. The president was okay with that. What an opportunity. And the very next morning, George Story presented himself at the White House with his sketchbook and his journal. And he was shown into the president's office. President Abraham Lincoln sat at his desk, a long, open, low affair with a large window behind him, leaving his face in shadow much of the time. But when he thought about something, he would lean back in his chair and take a deep breath. It was then that the light from the window illumined his face and all the emotions that tracked across it were seen. Along this wall were great windows that looked out over the back lawn of the White House, down over a glimmering Potomac River that June morning, over an unfinished monument and on to Arlington, the home of Robert E. Lee. And somewhere out of sight beyond that was a growing army of the Confederacy. Behind the president was a door to the private family chambers, and the door which George Story had come through from the hall that was filled with a throng of people all vying to get to John Nicolay and be the next to bring their problem to the president. And so he sat down and began to sketch and take notes. And the day went on and on, and gentlemen came and went. At one point, the Secretary of the Senate was shown in. He had a bill in his hand, and he handed it to the president. He sat back and relaxed. And he began to read. Nicolay, Nicolay, can you assure me that every word of this is correct? I don't have time to read the whole thing. I have to be certain before I put my name to it. And John Nicolay gave that assurance. And Abraham Lincoln signed the bill funding the infantry from Massachusetts and other states in the North that were coming. And he was shown out of the office, and the visitors continued, and George Story continued to take his notes until the day had grown long and the shadows deep across the office, and the door to the private chamber creaked open. In tiptoed a small middle-aged servant, possibly 45 years, and graying at the temple, and he tiptoed up to the president. Marcia Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln, she done tell me to tell you dinner is ready now, sir. Yes, sir, she said ready now, sir. Yes, sir. President Lincoln continued working, and the servant retired to the quarters. Some time went by, and more guests came and went. 
and the door creaked open a second time and the tiny man tiptoed in again. Mars the President, Ms. Lincoln done told me your dinner have gotten coal. Mr. President, President can't have no coal dinner, no how. <sighs> and the servant retired unanswered again. The third time the door clicked open, some minutes later, it swung wide on its hinges and Mrs. Lincoln stood in the doorway. Mr. Lincoln, your dinner is ready now. Come. With that, President Lincoln rose from his desk. You'll have to excuse me, gentlemen. I'm going to dinner. And that concluded his day in the White House. And George Story went back to the studio and began to paint. And the painting was coming along quickly now. It was filling in, but it was missing an important element. And he would have to return again. On that third day, the situation was exactly the same, and he sat sketching in the long stream of people coming in from the hall. At one point, a young man came in, proud and erect, maybe 35 years, with a packet of letters which he presented to President Lincoln. Lincoln sat back, as was his manner, and began to read. And he read every word. Sir, you would like me to give you a commission in my army as a colonel. And somehow you've gotten this letter from someone at home in Chicago stating that, and it, it was sent to the Secretary of the Navy, whom you were able to see, and somehow convince him to write you a letter to the Secretary of War. And although he's the busiest man in Washington, somehow you've managed to see him and have him write a letter to me suggesting that you be a colonel in my army. Sir, may I suggest to you that if you would like a commission as a colonel in my army, you go home to Chicago, raise me a regiment, and then we'll discuss it. You're excused. And the young gentleman bowed his way out of the office of the president. George Story finished taking his notes and sketches and returned to his studio. And now the painting was coming along and finishing. He finally was able to add that humanity that was Abraham Lincoln, had to capture all the emotion of emancipation and war and the home. George Story born in 1835 in New Haven, Connecticut, was the man who painted Lincoln, a painting of which now hangs in President Obama's office, still inspiring a nation.